Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and today we're exploring the topic of loss. This episode and our coverage of loss this year is sponsored by one of my dearest friends, Victor, and his wife, Jessica Kagan, in honor of Rachel Minda Bas Nasanata and Naftali Ben Chaim Shraga Feivel. To discover more of 1840 content on the topic of loss, visit 1840.org, 18FORTY.org, where throughout the nine days leading up to Tishabov, we'll be having new content exploring and examining the topic of loss in our religious lives. Astute listeners may notice that the introductory music to this podcast is not our normal fare, and the reason is twofold. First and foremost, there is a custom observed by many not to listen to instrumental music during the nine days leading up to Tisha B'av that begins on Rosh Chodesh Tisha B'av, the beginning of the month up until Tisha B'av. There is a custom not to listen to instrumental, upbeat music. And secondly, I think this song and the context of this song really helps us better understand what confronting loss is all about. The words for this song derive from the words that we say during Kedusha, when we come together as a community and repeat the Shimona Esrei, Particularly on Shabbos, we say the following words, and I'll read it in Hebrew, and then I'll translate. Mimkomcha malkenu Sophia, from your place, our God, King, you will appear. V'simloch aleinu, and you will reign over us. Ki mechakim anachnu lach. Because we wait, we anticipate you. And the song, the high part of the song, which is taken again from Kedusha on Shabbos, Masai Timloch Bitzion, when will you reign in Zion, Bekarov Biamenu, speedily in our days, Laolam Vaed Tishkon, forever and ever? Tiskadal Vitiskadash, the words that come from the famed prayer of Kaddish, now appear over here that you should be exalted and sanctified. Betoch Yerushalayim Ircha, Within Jerusalem, your city, Lador Vador, in each generation, Ula Netzach Netzachim, and for all eternities. It's fascinating that this appears uh, during our Shabbos prayers, during Kedusha. It is very often sung, as you heard it sung in the introduction. Why does it appear specifically during these prayers? Why is it specifically on Shabbos that we have such a moving prayer? crying out and calling for God, so to speak, to have His presence manifest in our lives. Uh, It is not the language that we use during the week. It is specifically on Shabbos that we talk about this. And I think the reason why this comes specifically on Shabbos has to do with the way that we contend with loss, the way that we examine and allow loss to be manifest within our own lives. I've always found it striking when I used to study in yeshivas near Yisrael in Baltimore. There was a custom they they had, and it's a custom I've seen in many other institutions, uh, mostly in yeshivas, but I've seen it in, in, in non-religious institutions as well. And that is, if you go to the front of the Beit Midrash, right to the right of the Aron Kodesh, the central ark where they take out the Sifrei Torah, in Near Yisrael in Baltimore, you will find an empty chair. And I've always found it incredibly striking and moving that there is an empty chair there. There's no one who is assigned to sit in that chair. There's nobody whose chair that belongs to. Um, it remains empty. Why do they have an empty chair in the Beit Medrash of Near Yisrael in Baltimore? It was the chair of their founding Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Ruderman who began the yeshiva, and ever since he has been in the yeshiva, I believe, uh, ever since he has passed, no one else has occupied that chair, and they leave that chair empty. There is a curious relationship that we have with loss that sometimes absence needs to be highlighted. And I think one of the most moving ways that we do that is giving a presence to absence itself, highlighting 
what we are missing, highlighting what has been lost. An empty chair in a base medrash is the presence of absence. It is showing you that we do not have everyone present in this room. There is somebody missing in this room. And I believe that throughout Jewish life and throughout our life, we really have two ways of highlighting loss, of highlighting absence. And these two ways are paralleled in the ways that we commemorate the very destruction of the Beis Hamigdash, which is what we reflect upon on Tisha B'Av. As Rabbi Soloveitchik was fond of noting, and as others have pointed out as well, we have two mechanisms through which we remember the Beis Hamigdash. We have some customs and rituals which are in memory of the Beis Hamigdash. They are practices that we go through in order to remember what life was like when the Beis Hamigdash was there, when the temple in fact stood. Observances such as taking the lulav all seven days of Sukkot, which was really only done in the time of the temple, in the time of the Beis Hamigdash. Once it was destroyed, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said we should do this all the time, Zecher Lemikdash, in memory of the presence that we have lost, in memory of that life that we are no longer able to live. These are a set of rituals, and it's not the only one, there are many other examples of things that we do to remember, so to speak, that we have lost. There are other things that we do that are not zecher lemikdash, but that are zecher lechurban. They are in memory of what was destroyed. They are highlighting what is absent. We have several rituals and observances which are meant to highlight that we are missing something. They are not perpetuating the customs that we had when the temple stood, but they are highlighting the fact that we are missing something. Something is absent. I think in many ways in our lives and in our families, we have both of these things. We can lose a loved one, we can have a patriarch, we have somebody in our family who's lost, and the way that we perpetuate their memory, so to speak, is through Zecher Lemikdash, to continue the observances, the values, the things that characterize their lives, so long as they were with us, we continue them even within their absence. That may be telling over stories and jokes or repeating ideas and values that they embodied within their lifetime. Yet we do something else, and that is Zecher Lechurban, to remember the absence itself, to remember that we are missing something to leave, so to speak, a chair empty at a table, to remember that when we gather together, not everyone is here, not everything that needs to be present no longer exists. We give a presence to absence itself. And I believe in many ways this is what we are doing on Shabbos when we say Kedusha. It is in the middle of Kedusha and Shabbos in the most sanctified moment when we repeat the Shemona Esra and we gather together as a community and we taste the wholesomeness, the beauty of the redemptive experience that Shabbos represents. And throughout Shabbos, we actually give presence to absence. Because if we are going to really experience the redemptive nature of Shabbos, we also need to give some presence to the absence of redemption that still exists in our lives. And that is why so much of Shabbos liturgy actually highlights the absence of the Beis Hamigdash, of the Temple. Because if Shabbos is one expression of redemption in time, then we also need to recognize that we still are absent the redemption in space, namely the Beis Hamigdash, the Temple. And when we come together on Shabbos, as a community, and repeat our prayers collectively, the Shemona Esrei, when we come together in Kedusha, we're able to have a moment and say, while we have this redemptive experience of time that we're able to palpably create in our lives, we still need to recreate the presence of absence of the redemption of space in this world, most notably the absence of the Beis Hamigdash. And it's why there is an element of lament within this prayer. We're not mourning on Shabbos. In fact, what we are doing is reminding ourselves and connecting th to the presence of the Beis Hamigdash through its absence. By repeating the lines of Ki Mechakim Anachnu Lach, that we still wait, we still anticipate that wholeness and that presence, 
And the only way to hold on to some things in their absence is by highlighting the presence of absence itself. And that is that second path, not the path of Zecher Lamikdash, not the path of highlighting and continuing the values and ideas that existed within the presence of the Beis Hamikdash, within the presence of a person's lifetime, but Zecher Lechurban, the memory of the destruction, the memory of what is absence, and giving presence and longing and anticipation for that wholeness to return. And I think it's for that reason why I find this song so moving, and in particularly where this song is being sung. The introductory song of Mimkomcha was sung together as a group at the funeral of Donnie Morris, of blessed memory, one of the 45 souls who were lost at the tragedy in Mayrone. And it was at his funeral, at that time when they were saying their final goodbyes, that the crowd began to sing Mimkomcha, a song that we normally associate with Shabbos, but I think in a larger sense is giving presence to absence and finding a way in these ephemeral lives that we live to give some stability, some connection that we're able to perpetuate memory and recognize absence. To take the impermanence of our lives and through whatever means possible, find a way to still remain connected and attached to the stability of God and spirituality that endures through all generations and for all eternities. It is why it is our deep privilege to speak today to Donnie's mother, Merlana Morris. This is an absolute privilege to be speaking today with Merlana Morris, the mother of Donnie Morris, uh, who passed away uh, on Lagba Omer during the massacre in Mayrone, the tragedy in Mayrone. Every year we talk a little bit about loss, about memory, what it means to confront loss and perpetuate somebody's memory, especially those we love around Tishabov, who is really our privilege to welcome Merlana Morris. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to begin not with the loss, but really who Donnie was, because I found it incredibly remarkable. There was one thing about Donnie, uh, you know, we... I, I, I felt like we shared a lot in common because we went to the same yeshiva. I'm a Shalavim alum too. Uh, he grew up in Bergenfield. I grew up in the five towns, but we live fairly close to one another. And there was something that people were able to almost identify their better selves within Donnie. And the one thing that really stood out to me, which was so deeply moving, it, it was passed around a lot online. And I, I remember my heart sank when I saw it because I was so moved. I would have been moved regardless of the context of how it was shared. But he had this schedule from Yeshiva. And his schedule from Yeshiva had his daily learning, which was like very impressive, might I add. Uh, but the part that I found most moving was that on Thursday night on his schedule, he wrote, Call Grandma. And it was in his schedule, somebody who... You know, puts that in their schedule as a certain kind of person. How do you describe Donnie? Thank you. So, obviously, I think every parent, every parent feels that their kid is wonderful, right? Um, and Donnie was special. We always thought so, of course, um, like our other children. But there definitely was something unique about him. I'm not sure I even realized um, the extent of it till after he was gone. But... Even from a very, very young age, he was um, very rigid. Some would say OCD. <laughs> um, and as a child, it was actually a little bit difficult to deal with because um, he wanted everything to be so perfect and so right. And while that could be amazing, it could be very difficult as a parent. Sure. Um, you know, if the we always went home a certain way and let's say that road was closed and I had a switch... Um, a different way, he would freak out. He'd be like, no, we have to go left. We always go left. And, you know, if I pulled into the driveway a different way, um, he'd be like, no, turn around, turn around. This is, I'm talking about like a year and a half years yeah. old. So um, I remember it being quite a challenge. And, you know, and even speaking to a professional, like, what do I do? Like, yeah. I'm not used to this. Um, and I'll never forget that um, the therapist at the time said, no, 
not putting him on medication. No, he does not have OCD. There's no diagnosis for him. He's just almost too smart for his own age. And eventually you'll see it's going to become a positive thing and he's going to grow into himself. Okay. So at that point, that wasn't so comforting because I still had to deal with it, right? Um, and then I had two other children after that. And for, I would say, a good five to seven years, he was like that in a way that it was very difficult. However, as he started to get older, I really, really saw what he was talking about. And um, it just was so much easier because when he came home from school, I didn't have to argue with him, go do your homework, you don't watch TV first. He would just naturally go do his homework. Um, he would do whatever the teachers told him to do. He would go to other people's houses for play days and they're like, oh my gosh, I love your son. Like, we always want Donnie to come over. Um, he really was just a very good kid who followed rules and, you know, I guess in his own way, kind of had his schedule, um, so to speak, from a younger age. And um, he just loved to do everything right, but also like he always loved Torah and davening. And even I I'll always remember that um, he didn't like when my husband went to work and left the house. He always had a special bond with him and he would cry um, when Ari would leave um, unless Ari told him he was going to shul. So if Ari said he was going to shul, he got a pass. He got a pass. And many times, Ari would have to take his black hat with him or a sitter because Donnie was smart enough to realize. Like, and pretend. And pretend that he was going to shul. And if he was going to shul, Donnie would start stop crying and he was allowed to leave the house. And he started to go to Hashkama with Ari. Um, I want to say when he was seven years old. Wow. He would probably wake up Ari half the time. <laughs> um, so he wouldn't be late. And they would go to shul, his bar mitzvah. I think everyone still hates me in the community for um, making everyone come out on hashkama for his bar mitzvah, but that was his minion. You did a hashkama bar mitzvah. Yes, we did. That's my dream too. I yes. want you to know that I'm a hashkama Jew <laughs> mm -hmm. and my dream that I've already begun like laying the groundwork for. I I'm working harder on, on my wife. I'm mm -hmm. really like, I want to do a hashkama bar mitzvah and I think the community is going to hate me too. Well, it's okay because you know what? Your close <laughs> yeah. friends come out yeah. and that was really his minion. So why should I make it in another one that's not sure. where he davened? Um, which actually now it's a beautiful thing that in Beth Abraham in the shul, we are actually turning the base medrash, which is where um, the Hashkama minion is held, into Donnie's base. And it's going to be beautiful. And does, does, it's going to be um, in his name and everything like that. So, but with that being said, he really, he just loved it. When he went to camp, he went to Camp Dora Golding for many, many years. And um, he went to the Cocoa Club every morning. Um, he just, just loved it. He loved to dive and he loved to learn. And we always knew that. But, but I guess what we didn't really realize was also, as you had mentioned, was like call grandma was his being Adam Le Javero piece and the all the wonderful personal, like how he would deal with others. And, you know, I have to say when he first passed away and people would tell me stories, I don't want to say I was cynical about it. I was like, yeah, of course, you're going to tell me he's a great kid. You know, yeah. oh, I, oh, he was wonderful. Oh, that smile was beautiful. And I'm like, you didn't tell me that three years ago. I never heard people say he has such a great smile. You know, yeah. where, where, where are all these stories coming from? Are you just trying to make me feel better? But the truth is, um, one after another, it you started to realize it's not made up. Like people are just not making up their stories. And there were very specific ones. It wasn't just like, oh, he's a great kid. They would give me like a, a detailed thing like, for example, let's say in camp, most people request bunk mates, right? Um, or specifically, don't put me with someone. But I was told and I was shown like that people were asking for Donnie to be their counselor. That doesn't typically happen. Wow. Um, so it's true. And those were things pre, you know, pre Donnie. And then people were just, that's all the stories. Like you could just see like everyone really felt like he was their best friend. Like he made everyone feel that way. He gave everyone that attention. And it's so funny when people come over to me, yeah, like, so Donnie and I were best friends. Oh, Donnie and I, when we were best friends, and I'm like, mm, okay. Like, I didn't know that. I don't think he even thought that. But the feeling that he gave others um, to feel that way, obviously, he was very special in that sense. It's, it's so interesting that you're telling me that because I began with the schedule, and I'll be honest, the <laughs> first time I saw the schedule, I saw, you know, it was very moving and very beautiful. A little teeny tiny part of me was like, oh, this is like someone who like just started doing this kind of thing like in israel like he's mm -hmm. oh he's like flipping out but this was who he was like regimented focused disciplined and, and having all of that and and the fact that you put in your schedule as a part of your religious schedule 
to call your grandmother. It says something about a person that that's a part of, it's not the break from your learning. That's a part of your religious development, which is really, really incredibly powerful. One of the reasons why I specifically like to talk, I mean, I don't like to talk, but we do talk about loss before Tishabov, uh, is because there is a notion of Tishabov kind of subsuming all tragedy, that it is described as the time where all tears, all difficulty, all challenges are subsumed within Tishabov. We don't commemorate it with uh with with other you know holidays we don't have separate holidays for every tragedy we have tish above that so to speak subsumes all tragedy and i wanted to kind of speak a little bit about what it means to confront a tragedy of the magnitude of losing somebody so dear like donnie in your life and specifically maybe you could you could speak a little bit about what it means to confront such a loss it's different my my father's an oncologist, so he's definitely dealt with families who have experienced loss that I would say are more gradual, they're over time. Donnie's loss, which was a loss that was shared with the Jewish people, it was in the headlines, uh, was extraordinarily sudden and was the grieving process was very public. It was with the Jewish people. Like, and I'm curious to hear from you about how you initially confronted that loss and then maybe we could talk a little bit about what healing what processing looked like sure so of course um this loss came as a surprise um not to say that watching so if he was god forbid sick and watching him go through that would have been any better um i don't really have what to compare it to of course um but yes, um, dropping him off at the airport for his year in Israel, which he was so excited for, and then to think that was the last time I ever saw him is crazy. Um, of course, um, we were supposed to go several times throughout his year, but COVID didn't yeah. make that happen. Um, and then he was supposed to come home for Pesach. And um, he, there was that slight possibility, you know, because of COVID, that he wouldn't get back into the country. So sure. he was too nervous. So at the last minute, he chose to stay. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard, but that's what, again, his year in Israel, he didn't want to miss out. If he would not have been able to go back, that would have been devastating for him. So the thing we dropped him off in August and never saw him again is very difficult. Um, I'm a private person, <laughs> actually, um, with a lot of things. Like we had just bought a house a month before and I told people like that week that we were moving, you know? Um, so then for now, this like, this loss like became everyone's, yeah. you know, loss, which, I understand, but um, when he went missing, I was getting calls. There was Tehillim chats, and so many things were going on throughout that night. It was um, it was comforting knowing so many people cared and came to rally with us, but it was extremely difficult. Even when we were told that he had actually passed away, there was like people in my house, like, and then people just kept coming. It was really um, I don't I don't even know how to describe it. It was just that's otherworldly. It's, it's the most private, intimate moment in a person's life. And everybody wants to like share in the loss, but there's there's a balance of giving space to the actual person in grievance who's grieving, and that's really tricky. It's 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 terrain that people probably don't do perfectly. They're, they're, we're not trained, thank God, because we don't expect to have these things. But you're you're kind of in a room with people coming in and out, the askanim, the people helping. And at that moment, you want to be alone. You feel alone, I'm sure. Of course. Um, right. And sometimes there were so many people around. So there were people technically there. But inside, of course, you just feel alone. You just want to like go into bed, co cover yourself with a blanket and just be done. But that's not how I did it or realized that, that need, that's not the way to do it. Um, with, you know, having a Muna, which of course I do and um having a family and other you know a husband and two other children that wasn't the choice i was going to make was just to fold right um we had to continue on <clears throat> never gonna move on but need to move forward um so confronting the loss to me um how i made it through or continue to make it through because every day is different and sure. some days are 10 times worse than others and i have bad days very bad days um 
But I think what helps, you know, me and our family is first of all, knowing that we do have such an amazing support system. Um, but also the belief that I, I think I feel that he didn't die in vain. I feel like he had a purpose. And I think that, you know, it's been somewhat clear throughout so many things throughout the year, right? Um, and continues on in his memory um, is what helps, you know, not that, you know, we don't need attention and we don't need people constantly talking about him in that sense, but knowing that people have really been able to change in a, for the better because of him um, and the situation is, I don't want to say comforting, but it helps you move on. Like you don't feel like he just, he didn't die without a purpose. And um, so many people like throughout the world, he's touched, I think him, the other 45, you know, the all the 45 Kadoshim, right? They made a difference. They made an impact. Um, he's part of Jewish history. And I have to believe that while he was doing so much good here, like so much good in a, twisted way he's kind of reaching more people now and more people are doing good because of him and um and when i start thinking or feeling sad i just say like if we believe in you know the jewish faith right and we believe in olam haba and everyone says like a minute there is better than a whole lifetime here right and that's what we're supposed to believe and we do then how am i supposed to be upset he's in the right place he's happy he's where he's supposed to be to me, it's sad, and I miss him a lot. But I know that um, he's happy. I do. I mean, I wish I really knew because there's no way to really know. Sure. But um, I have to believe that he is. And, um, you know, someone one time said that when you're under <clears throat> 20 years old, you don't get judged, and you go straight to Shemaim. He was 19. Um, he got like a ticket straight to the Kisea cupboard, right? And um, we always want what's best for our children. We all daven, right? Like <clears throat> that our kids should be great kids. And um, he was. I don't feel like my tefillah weren't answered. I feel like they were in a very different type of way. I never imagined that, but he did. He was a great kid. He made an impact. He's still making an impact on this world. And I'm supposed to be angry. I, I can't. I'm not angry. I'm sad, but I'm not angry. And um, I think that's how I'm able to cope, so to speak, with the loss. Because I, I know that he's in a good place. He's in the right place, <clears throat> as hard as it is for me. Um, I believe that um, he's exactly where he's supposed to be. You know, I, I heard once from Rabbi Ganak something that I always found deeply moving, where Rabbi Ganak, uh, talking about the loss of somebody in his life that he knew that uh, meant a great deal, and he said that great poetry and great music is never, their beauty is never measured by their length. Their impact is never measured by their length. And in some ways, you know, that, that is powerful and true of a life and of a person. So, you know, I paid a shiva call. I remember, you know, the house was, it was during like the in-between period of COVID. It was like when people, so I think it was still masked at the time. Some did, some did it. Yeah, some did, some did it. But I, I think there were, you know, outdoor, outdoor windows open. And I'm curious about what your relationship is to the halachic process of mourning of the shiva period um i think there's always you know mistakes faux pas that people make when they come in um the things that you learn that are incredible about the person how did you how did you manage what was your experience uh, through Shiva, where the even being present, it, it, it's so hard. I'm a natural introvert, even though I spend a lot of time outside. But like you said, you know, going upstairs and going under the covers would, you know, that's a reaction. Just cope with anything. Like I just, I, I don't want to be public. A private is what gives me strength. So I'm curious what your reflection was on the process of being people coming in, circling in. You had, you know, a, a sign in book to to see who who was there. I remember I signed it in Shalavim class of uh, of O two, I believe O two O three. Um, but I'm curious, what did you learn about the Jewish process of mourning? So I definitely feel like there's a reason. You know, everything that. <laughs> 
it's been put in place for us. There's a reason for it. And you don't always realize that till, like you said, like you go through it and um, you really reflect upon it. So, so at the time, like I said, from day one, there were people in my house. I feel like I really sat Shiva for an extra few days. Yeah. <laughs> so it already started on Friday, which was a little bit hard because we never really had that time to cope alone. Um, but on the other hand, it is comforting um, knowing that there's so much support. And like you said, like hearing all these amazing stories that I did not know. And I'm like, is this my son? Like sometimes you feel like I felt there were times I was like, I'm his mother and I didn't even know these things. Like, where was I? You know? Um, but I think that sometimes also made, made it more special because he didn't sh try to show off or he didn't do things for my husband and I to know or, you know, even, you know, I'll tell you before um he passed away in april <clears throat> i had bumped into a friend and she's like mazel tov i'm like for what i didn't even know what she was talking about she goes donnie i'm like donnie what so she's like oh my son's in shalavim and i have all these pictures he did a see him because he was born ever pesach so um i guess not to fa have to fast he had done a see him for the entire shalavim on pesachim which is wow. quite difficult yeah um, and he didn't even tell us and i called my husband and he's like no I had no idea. So I called Donnie. I'm like, I'm so proud. He's like, oh, no big deal. I just started learning it. Like, he didn't do things for a pat on the back, you know? And all those stories throughout the week, it was just like one after another after another. And it was sad. They're all sad. But they're, it's like that mixed emotions, you know, um, bittersweet. So um, it definitely helped. I think that a lot of people that came, you know, friends, friends of his, friends of ours, from all different, you know, parts of our lives, um, from, you know, my childhood friends to coworkers to colleagues, everything. And, you know, my husband's, it was, it's quite a whirlwind. I mean, there are definitely people who are there just to mourn with us from like a Claudia Sorrell standpoint, sure. and we're not anyone we knew. Most people were amazing. <laughs> you always have those people who I don't believe anything is their fault. They don't mean to say things that are hurtful or yeah. inappropriate. Sometimes people should just probably not say anything if they don't know yeah. what to say. Um, I do remember one person coming in, very odd. Like, I don't even know who was a rabbi, but he looked something like that. Um, and I remember him getting up there and he was like, your son was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I'm like, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Could you please leave? Like, it was really odd. So we had a few of those encounters. Sure. Um, but overall, um, there's something to be said about Shiva. I mean. I don't know people are with you which you don't realize that you need you know reminiscing and hearing stories it yeah it was um i don't want to use the word good but there was something about it that was um warming right restorative and, sure and you know it, i didn't realize it till the day you get up from shiv i never knew this obviously because why would i know um the rabbi came over and he's like we need to go outside i'm like what are we doing he's like so technically donnie was what you're the person who passes away is with you the entire shiva <clears throat> and on the last day you walk around the block and that's when you kind of say goodbye and they go up to Shemaim. So that was really difficult. Um, that was really difficult and not, I didn't realize that until that day. The, 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 the Neshama is really there. Yeah. And the most painful part being the stepping outside mm -hmm. and almost stepping away from the Shiva process. Is, yeah. is is the most painful transition because you're you're now kind of rejoining and i'm saying this with very clear air quotes like the normalcy that now now you're rejoining the routine and that shift can can feel that you're stepping away from that ritual observance where you have the memory the neshama kind of captured Correct. through through the practice that that's really good do you have any uh, it's a strange thing to say, and the answer could be no. Do, do you have any advice? I mean, anytime somebody steps in, um, and I remember for myself, you know, when when I heard Donnie had had passed, you know, there there there's right away you you you, you want to be there as behalf of Clive. So there is also a feeling of like, okay, like they they, they don't know me. I'm not going to say anything. I don't really have any memories aside from the fact that we shared an institution in Israel. Um, and I remember when I came there, I think there was literally a bus of people coming from like, just, do you have any advice for what it means to part, to participate, to be there, to be present 
um, in the aftermath of such a tragic loss, uh, not on the side of, of the person who's grieving, but of the person who's trying to provide some comfort, meaning, did you learn anything? Do you have any direction of, let's say, this is something that is helpful, this is something that is not helpful? So I think that's a hard question to answer because what I may need or want is different than what maybe what was helpful for my husband or my son or my daughter. So like my son, for example, he's an MTA. Um, and he was in 10th grade at the time. And for him, it was, you know, good for him that the buses came from MTA and they had different shifts and different times and they kept him busy. And he was like, you know, just talking with them all day and distracted. And that was good for him. While yeah. my daughter is definitely more private and she was like, stop, stop the trips. I don't want the school coming, you know? Um, and not for any other reason. She's like, but if they didn't talk to me yesterday in school, why would they come here today? Yeah. You know, like her point is like, we're not friends. Yeah. Not in a bad way. It's nice that you want to do something nice, but sh that wasn't, that's not for her. So sure. I think it really is a very personal thing. And what works for one doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. Um, so, you know, I think, I don't want to talk for my husband per se, but I think that, you know, he talked a lot throughout Shiva, um, you know, just... He liked hearing the stories I, I also did. Um, to me, my biggest fear, actually, and I have said that we our first day that we sat Shiva was in Shalavim. So you could only imagine that how difficult that was. Sure, um, in the yeshiva. In the yeshiva where he was. Also, a lot of his friends, you know, from childhood and all, you know, came, even if they were in Shalavim or not. And to see boys his age and not him was, was hard. Um, and... On one hand, while it was difficult, I, I wanted to hear the stories. I wanted to know everything. And, ev and I did throughout find out everything about him, even that night, like all the details that happened. And a lot of parents wouldn't want to know or wouldn't want to see the videos and things that went on that evening. You wanted to have. I needed to know. I, I had no control over what happened to him. But for whatever I could have control over after that, I needed to do for myself. That was part of my coping um, strategy. And... For me, it worked, and for somebody else, it wouldn't. To know the details of what Everything. happened. I, I'm, I'm curious, and you don't have to speak on this. I'm actually in, in, intrigued by that. I, I'm curious how this changed your relationship to Klal Yisrael, to the Jewish people, because on the one hand, it was a tragedy of the Jewish people, and we all carried it and shared it. I remember that I spent that Shabbos in YU. I was the scholar in residence that Shabbos. Mm -hmm. The first time I was spending Shabbos in YU. And I felt at a, you know, like, what do you say? Like, people wanted to hear something. And on the other hand, the circumstances of his passing, as you just mentioned, and you wanted to know these details, was really a tragedy also in a way caused by Klal Yisrael. And I'm curious how you were able, or I don't know if you, how did you integrate these two things at the same time that the Jewish people are there comforting you, they're being there for you. And at the other hand, it's undeniable and it's inescapable. The circumstances of his passing was so horrific and tragic and it was at the hands so to speak of the jewish people understood um so i really never put the two and two together that way um i i can't i, I can't think of it that way um i mean again i don't i look at it more that um i don't really quite sometimes comprehend the amount of people that were at may Rowan that evening is was astronomical, right? Um, throughout that night and everything, the hundreds of thousands of people. And to think only 45 people passed away, well, that's a catastrophe. It's only, the, my my chances of winning the lottery would have been greater, right? Sure. So um, it's like, and then like Donnie, like the one kid, you know, from, you know, our type of world, right? Our he, circle, the our North circle, circle. this exactly. isn't like... Right, like, why? Like, it doesn't even make sense. But then I realized it's not going to make sense. So I could try to make it make sense. It's, it doesn't. Um, the only thing I, I guess I try to 
cope with or understand or make it quote unquote easier, I guess, for lack of a better word, is that we needed someone, we, we, because Hashem doesn't need anything, we, Kal Yisrael, needed someone like him to be part of it and to pass away because as we've seen, he's been able to reach out to so many people, right? Just because the way we live our lives and um, between social media and, you know, my upbringing, my husband's upbringing, like we were from all the different high schools and camps and just keeps going on and on. It just keeps reaching people and reaching people and reaching people that just as sad that the other people pass away. Nothing, Donnie, lo losing Donnie is not any more sad than any of the other people who pass, but they do they live a little bit more sheltered, right? So they may not have reached as many people to make some sort of changes. And I think that um, that's why I think Donnie has almost become like the icon of Mayron, um in many ways. If you see like a lot of the papers and have his picture, also go back to that picture for a minute. What's the chances that- That picture, that, you, you mean the picture of him at Mayron that at was Mayron. taken, which is a beautiful picture. It's, seconds be literally before he well that was seconds before yeah pretty much before yeah. he got um trampled um <clears throat> first of all anyone who knows Tahani, he does not like to take pictures oh he does not like no. to take pictures. he's in pictures and you know especially in schools and camps but when i ask him to take a picture that's not really his thing um and the fact that you know his friend that he was with had told me that he insisted on taking that picture which is kind of strange but and they were trying to get out of there it was already it was like a mob scene they were sweating it was they had to get out and they were but he's like no no no, please we need to stop i want to take a picture <clears throat> i want to send it to my father i want him to know how happy i am that's what he said that's what he said wow and um so his friend's like okay it's not even going to come out the lighting the this to that but at the end of the day, you see that smile, that beam. Like it you, came out beautifully. It's like you can't even make it up. And it wasn't it's like picturesque. He was, yeah, and it wasn't like he was happy at like a Mets game or yeah. whatever. He was truly Simcha Sachayim in the middle of Omer and Mayron. And I think that's also a piece of why, you know, he has taken on so much. It's like he's in Mayron that picture. So when that picture went viral that he was missing, it was like he was just he's there. And I think that, you know, people, as we were saying, I think has touch on what you said before he's relatable that's why i think everyone was able to kind of connect to some degree and is still are connecting to him because he was still just a normal kid yes he had that impressive schedule yes he was regimen yes he liked to learn but he still loved sports he liked to go to 7-eleven for slurpees he he was just a normal kid he, mm -hmm. he he was really was normal um in the same time he was really really special so anyone could be that person you don't need to be the most grand learner you don't need to be anything really you could just be a regular kid and just take upon yourself something extra right just do another good deed make someone feel good like call your grandmother you know how many people have told me that since then their children call their grandparents before shabbos and that means so much to their grandparents and why did he have it on his schedule because you normally call your parents your grandparents on friday sure Right, so that's you don't need to be reminded to call because that's the normal thing the, to that's do. That's the routine, yeah. Exactly, but my mother-in-law, she's very busy on Fridays, I guess, and specifically, I told Donnie it would be better if you could call me on Thursday. <laughs> she rescheduled. Yes, so that's why he, because you don't to remember on a Thursday to call for Shabbos is, is not something that you would normally remember. So he had to put it on his schedule to make sure that he still called my mother-in-law, and um. I think that's pretty unique, but anyone could do that. That's not something like, wow, so difficult, but it does take someone who cares about somebody else to do that. And I think we all could do a little something, take on something um, that we didn't do before and and relate more back to Donnie. So th that really brings me back. And, 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 and I really, I believe what you said, because a lot of times when you're confronted again not the actual family but when you are in a distance and you then you know find out about loss you find out about all these tragedies but when you find that it's somebody who had the same background as you somebody who lived you know very close to you it, it, it transformed a community that otherwise would not necessarily have been transformed in the same way. There was something that everyone was able to see themselves within his life, within his his smile, 
um, that I know really, really transformed this entire community. And when I say community, I don't mean Teaneck Bergenfield. I mean, in the United States, like it was, we were transformed. I, you know, you mentioned about people, um, you know, how they, you know, the public, you know, taking on a mitzvah, beginning to call your grandmother. And there were so many beautiful initiatives. Shalavim published an absolutely beautiful uh, journal, like a safer mm -hmm. in, in Donnie's memory that was, was absolutely uh, beautiful. And hopefully we'll be able to link uh, to that online because it's something really worth looking at. I, I want to talk a little bit about memory because you know we, we spoke about what this loss was like and and there's something deeply heroic about you and and your your own processing wanting to look directly at what happened knowing the facts and then kind of like being both removed and private and also you know having that private moment surrounded in the public which that that, that that's kind of what i'm what i'm hearing which is deeply powerful you know on Tisha B'Av, we have this way of preserving the memory of loss, and we have all of these rituals. You know, we sit on low chairs, uh, we say kinos, and I always think of these as rituals. These are halachos that are preserving the memory of a loss. We want a loss to stay with us. And I'm curious for you about what you in your life you know you mentioned other people's life taking on a good deed what does preserving donnie's memory mean for you in the rituals what are the moments that allow you to reconnect with both you know the memory the life and the loss because with tish above we do both we have things that are both zecher in remembrance of the korban of the destruction and the loss and we also have things that are zecher lamikdash that are in memory of the presence of the Beis HaMikdash, the presence of the temple. So memory is both the memory of the absence and the memory of the presence. And I'm curious for you, um, how do you remember the loss and how do you kind of commemorate and perpetuate the life? So I don't think there, I, mean, I know, there's no day that goes by that I don't remember sure. Donnie or think of him or link something back to him, whether it's, you know, just having social media and your memories pop up, right? So sometimes like I'll, you know, be in a meeting or something and then a memory will pop up out of nowhere. It's like, it's, you know, it's actually quite sad. Um, <clears throat> but I think, so it, it's, you're, you're never going to forget it, right? Um, there's so many things that even in my own house that like I look at and it's, Donnie, even if it's not him, it's not his picture. Like, um, there's just certain things that just make you remember him, right? Um, I want to remember him. I don't want to forget him. I don't want anyone to forget him. I think that's the part I struggle with the most is, yes, First year, of course, like there's been so many amazing things and it's still continuing. But and I'm not saying there needs to be these huge, you know, um, things going on for him forever. But how do I know that he's going to be remembered by everyone else? I don't. And I think, of course, everyone says they will, but I don't know that. I think that's kind of a fear of mine. Um, and I remember the day when I was saying before that. The first day we went to Shalavim, <clears throat> I remember at the end of the, I was quote unquote fine. I had my composure was okay throughout the day. And then at the end, when I was walking out, I remember turning around and looking at the boys and just saying, please don't forget him. I know everyone needs to move on with their lives. And they should. And, you know, they're going to get married. They're going to have their own families. And I think that's, well, I'll be so happy for everyone. And I truly am. And I go to people's weddings and um, one of his good friends already got married. Um, and I really am happy for them, actually. But it's the morning of the loss that could have been sure. as well. And I think that that's really difficult. And I don't want to do that alone. And um it's scary to think that, you know, it's only been a year and a few months and 
a whole lifetime ahead of me without him. And um, I know I'll be able to preserve that memory. And I think that part of perpetuating his legacy is to do things like talk today. And, exactly. um, you know, when people ask me to talk or to do things and continue to do the things, you know, in his memory, but why I am private to make it not so private, because otherwise, how am I going to do that? Right. How yeah. am I going to expect to keep his life going and his legacy going if I, you know, just keep everything to myself? So it's also changing me a little bit or a lot of it. He's actually helping me <laughs> become a better person without even realizing it. Um, and I have to change how I used to be in order to make sure for the greater good that we are able to perpetuate his legacy. You, you do not strike me as somebody who would have ever jumped for an, an, an interview uh, outside of this context. And the fact that uh, you were willing to even speak is deeply moving and is really, this is for Donnie. This is for uh, his memory and to have people think about what it means to perpetuate a memory, to both remember absence and remember presence. I think those are two very different things. And you know, you, when you were talking about, you know, being at the wedding and at a simcha of somebody else who's a friend, that, that, that kind of, you, you remember absence in those moments. And then there are times when people start calling their grandmother and do things that Donnie did in his lifetime, and that's remembering presence. What, what you know, what Donnie in this very moment um, should, w w would have wanted me to do in my own life. I'm curious about what it means to kind of ritualize um, memory. And by ritualize, I mean, you know, in some homes they have, specifically as it relates to the destruction of the base Hamigdash, uh, there's a, a, an interesting custom that not everybody does, but I've always found fascinating, where they leave a part of the house that is um, like unpainted or mm -hmm. untouched. Some people like do these really beautiful designs on it, which I'm always mm -hmm. never sure if that's counterproductive because it's <laughs> right. like the most gorgeous part of the house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, but they have something that relates to the, the fact that we're not complete. You know, this home, as beautiful as it is, we're not complete. And I'm curious, you know, in a personal loss, what that means, meaning what does that mean for Donnie's bedroom, for Donnie's things? Is there a place in the house that you left untouched how, how does one both move forward but also preserve a place that you know in a in a real ritual sense in a in a in a static sense that it is going to be here still serves in that person's memory so i will tell you we have we're one of those people who has a little section that's unpainted when you walk in like painted differently but no it's not beautiful at all it's, it's not designed <laughs> no it's okay not. um so we do have that um say her um the base of mcdash um so the interesting thing is um i think it's a pretty much a bracha um we had literally moved six weeks before he passed away but donnie was never in the house so it's in actually I didn't want to even tell him that we were moving. I thought it would be fun when we picked him up from the airport just to, well, drive, to, a new, to yeah. drive him to a new house. And I was going to do that um, until I was kind of advised, like, word gets out. He's going to yeah. find out. And if he finds out from Israel that you moved and you didn't tell him. That's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and of course, ironically, when we moved, the movers broke his bed and I had to buy a new bed. Um, <clears throat> wow. So and I thought he was coming home for pace off. So I was like rushing to get his furniture and then the dresser wasn't ready, which again, ironically got the moving company pulled up on Friday after we were told he passed away with the dresser. And I'm like, you need to leave. <laughs> like really? today's not the day to wow. be delivering your the dresser. But anyways, um, so he was never actually in the house, which again, the bracha pieces, I don't picture him specifically anywhere. He doesn't have no, that yes. chair in the dining room. I don't see him anywhere that it's his bedroom, but he was never in that bedroom. Um, right now, it's a shrine of Donnie because and all the fan mail and pictures and letters and everything that people have dropped off and sent right now is just in his room, and I don't exactly know what to do with it just yet. Um, and I haven't gotten that far. Okay. Um, so I will say that you know during Shiva, um, my friends had. Put up a lot of pictures around the house um of donnie they had blown up different pictures that were beautiful but after like a few weeks my daughter kind of said can we take these away so i did 
And there was like nothing at all. And also I had not put up any family photos yet because again, you we had just, just moved, moved in. in. And it was so and eerie. It was, it was so crazy and it was Pesach and we just never even had a chance to do a lot of stuff. So, but after a while I was like, there was one canvas I had from my daughter's bat mitzvah of all of us. And I, I love it. Um, so I put it, I asked my daughter actually if, if it was okay to put it up. And she said, okay. And we put it up in our living room, but you don't see it unless you're actually in the living room sitting. So it, when you walk into the house, it's not like a focal point. Yeah. So we started with that. Um, Cause he is our, our, he is our family. Yes. And he's always going to be our family and I don't want him not to be there, but it's also that correct balance. Yeah. And also trying to make sure that my other kids are okay. So then um, a dream of mine always, and which I was unable to fulfill was to have a fam family pictures in Israel by the hotel, the old city, and for whatever reason, we just never went as a family to Israel. And um, I struggle with that too. Um, and then, I don't know, I was looking through pictures one day, and I found one that my husband had taken um, of Donnie when they went, when he was a senior um, in high school, to look at, the, just the two of them went during Hanukkah time to look at yeshivas for the following sure. year. I don't know, it's almost like, looks like a photographer took this picture and it, it's Donnie by the side of the hotel. It's just magnificent. He's just like looking. It's not, it's just great. It's a great picture. And I'm like, I need to use this picture somehow. And cause also you can't really tell that he's, it was two years ago. Like it's a side profile. So sure. the age wouldn't matter if I now put it up. So I spoke to the kids and I said, and I'm like, how do I do this? Cause I don't want to take, I feel weird taking family photos without him. Yeah. On the other hand, I want to somehow incorporate it all. So when we went this past January, we did hire a photographer and we took pictures in the old city without him, obviously. And um, <clears throat> I have an interior designer helping me and I just have to, we're almost ready to blow everything up and canvas it. But so we're going to incorporate the whole thing, Donnie with, by the hotel and us in the old city. Wow. And he's going to be like the way his you know view is he's going to be looking at us and we're incorporating it all together. So my den will have him and it'll be very open and front and center. And I, I'm sure it's going to be hard once those pictures are up on some degree, but in the end of the day, I, I want him up. We want him up. And, um, and this I thought was a, a good way to do it. That's soul stirring. I mean, that, that, that is deeply powerful and a, 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 an incredible way. Again, you know, I'm thinking about the halachic paradigm, you know, we build beautiful homes and there's a part, it's, it's a part, it's a, few, it's a piece of the home that is that memory. Doesn't mean that you can't have a home where, where you, you, you can't breathe outside of, of the memory of the loss. And that, that way of integrating him, both the loss and the life and being a part of your family, which he always is and will be, um, is really soul stirring. I don't have another word uh, to describe that. I'm curious just to, to kind of like conclude and, and really uh, on a very personal level, just your courage, your thoughtfulness, your strength. I don't know what's the compliment you, you know, everybody, it's always difficult to pay a compliment to somebody after a loss. And I don't know what words you specifically like to hear or don't like to hear. Um, and you could tell me, you're like, don't call me strong, like a a anything but, or don't call me, but, uh, there's something very vulnerable and alive in the way that you speak about Donnie and it's extraordinarily powerful. I, I, I want to end by, by talking a little bit about the things that help you heal, remember and I wanted to c conclude with basically asking you about a song, a tefillah, and maybe a, a book or an article or a word that somebody gave you. So maybe we could begin with when you, you know, in the process of healing, confronting loss, were there any books or articles that you read that somebody recommended you or even somebody that somebody told you that you found moving that you found resonant um and it could be more than one yeah of course. sure um i read a lot on the books of living with amuna okay 
Um, I think I went through all of them because I felt like that's where I needed to, to start. And really that encompasses it all, right? If I don't have a Muna, I can't move on because yeah. I don't, and I don't, I don't know how people move on, to be honest, if not. Um, I like the term you use, move forward. Yeah, and that's what it is. It is moving yeah. forward. You're never going to truly move on. Um, but so I just, I went through those a lot. Um, and it's interesting because it kind of goes back to my professional um, side is, you know, I'm a COO of a company and um, I read a lot of books on leadership. Okay. And how to be a better leader. And um You'd be surprised that also helps me with this because you know being a better leader is also giving of yourself and um how to treat others and i felt like those books helped me with this too because how i would treat others is now how i needed people in a weird way to treat me and not that i wanted to be the vulnerable one and i didn't act like that but it was kind of coming full circle on both ends so i would continue reading my work leadership books and also my living with Amuna books, and that's kind of. And those gave you that 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 strength. I I I'd like to know: is there a a song? Is there a a specific, even like a mitzvah that reminds you of Donny? That for you is, so to speak, the place where you re-engage with him. So songs. Um, so everyone knows, I think, that the Shalavim, there was a three Shalavim Shana Bet boys who composed a song for Donnie. Yeah. It's beautiful. So I listen to that a lot. Um, it happens to be a beautiful song, but also, to, you know, obviously, of course, it reminds me of him. Um, I will say anything with Beso <laughs> Megdash, um, Ani Mamim, all of those, actually, they're really hard for me. Those, um, like those are a trigger, um, <clears throat> and they are at every wedding. <laughs> um, it's a trigger in a different way. In a than different way. Like, it almost, can, it's hurt. It's like a knife thing. Why? I mean, Do you I mind explaining? Because I, I never thought of that, those songs, the same way as I do now. Now it's like, when pe do people really realize, or did I ever realize what I was say singing and saying? Like, I believe in Mashiach. I want Mashiach to come. Like, we want Yerushalayim to be rebuilt. Now it's like, I want it more than ever because that means I'll be reconnected with Donnie. And I never realized what I was truly saying. Even when I daven now, you know, Shona Esrei and you're saying Tehiyah Samesim, right? Like, did I really ever think about it? No. I mean, not that I didn't, but now I really, those words, every word means so different now. Like, and, um, it has a heaviness, meaning it's not a. Tr it's it's not making you angry. No, trigger, it's not. But it's, angry. it's it's, it's just... you're sitting at a wedding and everybody's kind of swaying to Mishkachich, but all of a sudden you this it there's a heaviness to what it means in your life because your relationship to loss itself has been reoriented. Correct. Um. So not trigger like I'm angry, but trigger that like I just I just think of everything so differently and like my yearning for you know. Mashiach to come, it just has such a different meaning to me now because all I can really think about is reuniting with Donnie, right? Um, so there's no particular song, I would say, but I think that and Rachel Mabaka means so different to me now too. And it's just so, they're just so meaningful. I just feel like I always loved Jewish music and I just did. And now I, I really do. And I just, they, every song somehow means something that's more meaningful to me than it ever was before. There was a moment at the Leviah mm -hmm. at his funeral where they began singing. Mm -hmm. And that moment was, it was otherworldly. It was otherworldly because it felt like you were reaching out to another world and hoping and, and not letting go of your grasp at that moment. Um, my final question is about Tefillah. 
and you know you had mentioned Tchias Hamason, but I'm curious for you, you know, what philos, what prayers give you some sense of healing, some sense of strength? Where do you find yourself? And when we think about mourning, when we think about Tishabov, so part of the way we preserve is through kinos, is a lamentation. Part of the way we preserve the Beis Hamigdash is through prayer. I'm curious, when you think of your own loss, what are the tfilos that allow you to feel most connected to Dani? So like everyone else, or like a lot of people have take on, taken upon things, you know, in memory of Dani, <clears throat> or to be a better person, I have too. Um, and some of those are actually tefillot. Um, It may sound kind of strange, but um, I actually always love to daven. I know that's one way I always connected. Um, Nothing and, strange about daven. <laughs> no. Um, and you know, sometimes you're rushing in the morning. Sure. I always run to a meeting, but thank goodness I always made time to daven. But sometimes yeah. I would skip things. Sure. I'm not going to say I didn't. And one thing I always used to skip were all the carbono, like in, because I don't know, I just did. And now I started to say them. Because to me now, their carbonot, again, have a different meaning. I actually picture them bringing their carbonot to the base of Mikdash. And I picture that whole other afterlife mm -hmm. that I never really did before. And then I picture Donnie in it. So to me, I think all those type of the philo are a way to connect with him. Um, Shmakulinu, everything. Like really, if you start picturing every single one, they really all go back to to that and um you know i i also even at night like i used to, i always said kriyat shema but i kind of again skipped over some um i i want to go to bed knowing that i i don't know i tried doing everything i could do during that day and um not that i really sleep but at least to try you know um so i'd say i i added more of that too um and try to connect with him as well that is uh, really incredibly moving, you know, to, to think that the carbonos, which is the part where, you know, let's be honest, that, that we almost all skip it, has taken on new meaning. You know, the, the pusuk that jumped out at me as you were saying that is what is on top of the Aron Kodesh in Eish Kodesh, which talks about the Mizbeach, where the carbons were brought, which is the verse that talks about the fire on top of the Mizbeach and says the Eish Tukad al mizbech, you should kindle a fire on the mizbech. Lo sichbet should never be extinguished, and that should be equally true for the memory, life, and legacy of Donnie. Um, really, that should be kindled and continued uh, throughout in all of the hearts of the Jewish people. Uh, Merlana Morris, it was an absolute privilege uh, to speak with you today. Thank you so very much. After I finished recording with Merlana, we stood outside my house for a little bit, reflecting on the interview and the difficulty of giving presence to absence and even being able to speak about this. It's with a great measure of courage that I feel like she was able to share her story and the way that she goes about reanimating, so to speak, Donnie's life and the values that he lived by is so incredibly moving that it really gives expression to these two aspects of loss that we began with, of perpetuating and remembering the memory and the values of what we lost within our lifetime, and also leaving space to commemorate, so to speak, as a picture to remember that empty chair of what we still don't have, the path of Zecher Lamigdash, the memory of the Beis Hamigdash, and each of our lives, so to speak, being that Beis Hamigdash, and also Zecher L'Churban, to remember the loss and the tragedy of what we no longer have palpably in our lives. On that driveway as we spoke together, she shared with me another presentation that she gave as she was just beginning to share her story. It was to a group of women who were doing a, a chalabake in memory of Dani because the family has embraced really perpetuating the values and the inspiration and the way that Donnie has touched so many lives. And she sent it to me afterwards, and I listened to it a few days later, and I found it so moving that I wanted to include it again as a testimony to what Emuna through loss is. Emuna, as many have pointed out, is a tricky term to translate. It's usually translated as faith. I remember hearing from the rabbi of 
my shul when I was growing up, he was talking about a family who had also lost a child far too early. And as the changing demographics of the shul, you know, most of their friends had stopped davening in the shul. They continued coming to the shul that I grew up in. In fact, they even donated, I believe, one of the Aron Kodeshes that was used, not in the main minion, but I believe in the downstairs minion. And I remember, or at least remember someone telling me that the rabbi one time spoke about this particular family and what the word emuna means. And he said the word emuna doesn't just mean faith. The word emuna means to be loyal, to be loyal to a certain set of values, to stay true to a certain set of values, even when palpably the inspiration for those values no longer exists. And he looked at this family and he said, you are Bali Amuna, you are remaining loyal. It had a double meaning when he was talking about this family because they've remained loyal to a shul after so many of their friends left. But in a larger sense, their Amuna was a loyalty to the values that they had raised their children was the values that their son had represented. And it's that loyalty that, at least for me as a listener, to Merlana really embodies an amuna of loyalty, of staying true to the values that she saw and raised within her son and that Donnie embodied throughout his lifetime. And that an amuna that we can have as listeners is not just an amuna, so to speak, in God and in divine providence, even through loss, even through tra- tragedy, but an amuna that we can have in each other a loyalty to stay true to the values that we see embodied by others and then to perpetuate their memory and their legacy within our lives. And it's that Amuna that Merlana spoke so eloquently to this crowd. Not even two weeks after the passing of Donnie, oh, Shalom, I had to write a paper for my MBA program on a defining moment in my life. I will share with you this evening the first part of what I wrote six months ago, as it clearly was the beginning of my journey. What is a defining moment? A defining moment to me is a moment in your life when you need to make a crucial decision or when you experience something that fundamentally changes you. Not only do these moments define who you are, but they have an effect that transforms our future perceptions and actions. Donnie, my 19-year-old firstborn before, passed away tragically. <clears throat> on April 30th in a room while celebrating Lagba Omer. As you can imagine, from the moment we found out he was gone, my life was forever changed. While it, while it is still so raw and surreal, I had to make a decision early on as to what my thoughts and behaviors would be moving forward. While I can't say I have all the answers, and I'm aware I will never know why it was my son, who was one of the 45 who died, out of the hundreds of thousands who were in attendance, one thing I do recognize is how I chose to believe in Hashem and not doubt my Amuna during a time that many would have. To do this is not easy, and to live with the pain is almost unbearable. But I know in my heart that Hashem has a bigger plan, even if I will never understand it. I definitely question at times, why my son? Why take a 19-year-old who has his entire life ahead of him? Why Donnie Morris, who I knew was an amazing young man? As well, as from all that has faded and the many stories that I'm being, that I am learning about, it just makes no sense. While he was such a normal kid, he loved golf, the Mets, Slurpees, and going out with his friends, he simultaneously reached a level of learning that was way beyond his years, treated everyone with a smile, and his acts of kindness were non-parallel. So again, why take him? He was doing so much good on this earth, but yet he was handpicked to be up in Shemayim. There are many who like to give their version as to why it was him that was chosen, and in all honesty, while at times it makes sense or provides comfort, I still can't help but to feel, why Donnie? However, even when all those thoughts go through my mind, and they do often, and yes, I've had many sleepless nights, I'm still taking this horrific moment to define me in a positive way and not turn me away from or be angry with Hashem. Rather, I'm trying to become closer to him. I will share with you a text that was sent to me by a mother of one of Donnie's friends who is also in Shaladin, along with Donnie. She received this text from her son right after he had attended Donnie's Levaya, and she was kind enough to share it with me. This text defines what I, at the time, didn't realize I was already transforming to be. In it, the boy writes, my Amuna was faltering. I was at a complete and utter loss regarding why someone as amazing as Donnie Morris was taken from us. I simply could not understand 
why Donnie and his friend, will ne his father, will never take a walk again. I wasn't able to process why we were never gonna see that smile again. I had so many questions and not a single answer. Standing by Donnie's grave, watching my friend being buried, my Amuna was nowhere to be found. I obligatory started singing in the Shachich, though I didn't feel anything. And then I saw Donnie's mother, somebody who literally had her world turned upside down in the past 72 hours. And what was she doing? She wasn't bawling, gasping for air in between cries. She wasn't blank faced, numb by all the pain, no. She was singing the words to Imesh Kharif with a facial expression, expressing one thing and one thing only, Emuna. And after that, she was singing along with all of us, Ani Maman, expressing her belief that Hashem was, is, and will always be, regardless of what's going on at that moment. As I saw that from just a few feet away, I did a complete 180. I thought to myself, if someone who is about to begin sitting Shiva for her son, with complete and unwavering Emuna and Hashem, who am I to let my Emuna crumble? I re-realized the understanding that Hashem truly has a plan. If Donnie's mom can see that no matter what the situation is, then I should be able to also. So thank you, Mrs. Morris, for helping me hold on to my Amuna. I clearly had no control over what happened to Donnie, but I did and continue to have a choice as to how I move forward from here. Despite my initial way of thinking, these past six months have not always been easy. I wish I could say I never had moments of doubt or anger, but thankfully those thoughts never lasted too long. I actually still ask the same questions. Why my son? Why was it Donnie Morris that was taken? But now I question it in a very different way. It's because of the many stories I have been told and learned of, which all indicate that Donnie impacted more people than I could have ever imagined, both before and after he passed away. It's because of Donnie that thousands of people across the world have taken daily mitzvah upon themselves learn extra blocks of Gemara, his rabbis in Eretz Israel and New Jersey talk about him on a constant basis, and his friends not only learn in his memory, but write Divrei Torah each month and correlate many partio back to Donnie and his impeccable mido, love for learning and love for life, which they are always sharing with me. A complete stranger from Belgium was in such awe of Donnie's daily schedule and his accomplishments that he wrote a book in his memory. It was this daily schedule, his Seder Hayom, that Donnie wrote committing himself daily to a most rigorous, intense schedule of Torah study, the highest level that he strictly adhered to. I actually bring this original handwritten daily schedule here with me this evening for all of you to see. A Seder Hayom that was unbeknownst to us at, until after his Patira. A daily schedule that truly demonstrated his determination and commitment to grow in Torah and Midos, as well as displaying his warmth, caring, and sensitivity as a as can be seen by that, what he penciled in to do every Thursday evening at 9.30 p.m., call grandma. So typical of Donnie's outpouring of love and respect for his grandparents. There's a story when Donnie arrived in Chalabin for the first time in the beginning of the Chodesh Elm, how he had asked his friend to do him a favor and wake him up every morning to the sound of the chauffeur's blast. The friend asked him, why? After all, most normal people wake up to the sound of a ringing alarm clock. To which Donnie responded, it's Elo, and I want to wake up with thoughts of Teshuvah. There's also the thoughtfulness and love of the three Shana Bet boys in Shalavid who composed a song on behalf of Donnie, a children's Torah library soon to be inaugurated in Detroit, where my brother-in-law lives. The Torah Learning Center being built in Shalavid, as well as Sifrei Torah being written, and much more. All was Echar Nishmat, my beloved Donnie. As a parent, don't we all daven that our children should be kind? and treat others with respect and make a difference in this world. We also ask they live a better life than we are and do so in a humble way. Donnie was all this and more. He was kind to all that knew him. The countless stories from his friends, from those he, from those he barely knew, his teachers, relatives, and campers all described him with such poise and a special demeanor. He literally made each person feel as if they were his best friend. While Baruch Hashem, there are too many amazing stories to share, I will retell the one Rabbi Avi Rosalimsky of Congregation Beth Abraham in Bergenfield wrote in an article days after he passed away. He said, last year before COVID, when the boys were about to play football in the park, I overheard one of the boys asking Donnie, why do you always smile? Don't you ever have a bad day? Donnie responded, every day that Hashem allows me to wake up and spend time with you guys is a great day. With that being said, how can I say Hashem didn't listen to my tefillah? How can I say I didn't have an amazing child? If anything, I should ask why me? 
Why was I lucky enough to have someone as special as Donnie? Who am I and what did I do to earn a son who literally is impacting the world and who is now an integral part of our Jewish history? It's clear he has inspired many, even complete strangers have chosen to name their newborn babies after Donnie, who lived for Torah, Chesed, and Am Yisrael, and they want their children to do the same. It's all this powerful and potent evidence that has shifted my views, feelings, and overall outlook on this entire situation. I know I will never truly understand why Donnie was chosen, but I believe wholeheartedly that Donnie and the other 44 special, special neshamas are fulfilling a tafkid. It's hard to imagine, but I see so clearly Hashem's hand doing this entire catastrophe. Everyone around Donnie that night in Mayroon passed away besides his friend that was right next to him. I feel so fortunate to have him alive, even if it's to retell me the excruciating details of that night, but in doing so, I see how Hashem's plan was meticulously done. Think about it. Over 800,000 people were in attendance. 45 people died, and only six were not from Israel. And one, just one, represented a broader base of the Jewish world, and that was Donnie. No way I can argue that this was a coincidence. And in knowing more details of that night, it's made even more clear. My son was not known for taking pictures, let alone sharing them. However, that evening, as they were overheated, trying to push through the crowds to exit their room, Donnie insisted on stopping and having his friend take a picture of him. His, his friend said, the lighting is bad, the picture will not come out, and they really needed to keep on moving. But Donnie insisted and said, please take a picture of me. I really want my father to see how happy I am. And so his friend took the picture, which Donnie sent to my husband. The picture that has gone viral of his smile, the smile of pure innocence and of true Simchas Chaim, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Kaber. It's that smile that has attracted people to him and to be better for him. Donnie and his friends were seconds from the exit, but stopped to help an elderly gentleman who fell. In doing so, they too fell and were trampled. Donnie, unlike his friend, fell on his back with his heart faced up, and his friend fell on his side. Again, not a coincidence. Donnie tried to save someone else's life. So again, how can I say I'm not proud of my son? He did what we teach our children to do, help those in need, and he did the best he could. He surpassed my expectations as a mother, and I'm supposed to be angry with Hashem? I'm sad, and there's a boy that will forever be there, but angry and upset, I just can't be. I miss Donnie more than imaginable and truly wish he was still physically here with me. <clears throat> However, this is selfish on my part, since I, of course, believe in Olam Haba, and we know that one minute there is better than an entire lifetime here. He's in a great place. He's learning in Rabbi Shimon's base in the Josh. More so, we learn that if one passes away under the age of 20, they are not judged and go straight to Shemayim with a clean slate. Donnie was 19 years old. He had a, he had a ticket straight to the Kisei HaKavod. I can picture him with an adorable smile, learning and dancing with all the other wonderful people we know and have learned about throughout Tanakh. Speaking of which, until this day, I'm really unsure as to how we were so glad to have Donnie buried in Har Hazesim, literally facing the gates entering into the base of Mikdash, in an area which is nearly impossible to be granted on a, granted a burial plot. He's surrounded by Nabian, Rav Kup, and other great Gedolim. Why was Donnie Zofa to such a holy spot? I truly believe that it can be attributed to our unwavering Amuna in the power of tefillah and to our sincere belief that no tefillah, especially when accompanied by tears, is ever wasted. Who will or can ever possibly forget that horrific Thursday evening, Lagba Omer Eve, as well as that entire Friday, the most heartfelt outpouring of tefillah from an entire united Am Yisrael, across the globe for the missing, the injured, and for those who have passed on, as well as for their grieving families. It was the power of those tefillah and our belief that no tefillah ever goes wasted that secured my Donnie such a most holy grave site. I don't know this for sure, but what I do know with great certainty is that Hashem is taking good care of Donnie and that I need to thank him for the 19 years I had with him. If Hashem would have come to me 19 years ago and told me he can give me a gift, a son, who would impact this world and influence people to do better, but he would need to be taken back after 19 years, would I honestly have told Hashem no? I have thought extensively over this question, and I can't imagine not wanting to partner with Hashem in my being the mother of Donnie, 
and sharing his everlasting impact in this world. Of course, I wish I knew of Hashem's plan, but in truth, if I was pre-warned, then Donnie wouldn't have been who he was, and I wouldn't be where I am today. As Donnie was being buried, and you hear the song and the people sing, Mimkomcha Malkenu Sophia, from your place, God, that you appear, that you are manifest. Hearing that song as they were burying a person who died far too young under such tragic circumstances really just totally reframed this prayer that I've associated for almost my entire life with Shabbos. But when you take a second look at it, you see all of the words that we normally associate with mourning, Mimkomcha, Malkenu Sophia, Mimkomcha from your place, in many ways reminds of Hamakom Yenachim, the place that we refer to God as the place when we comfort others. And I think there's something very moving and very powerful in this prayer and the fact that they're singing this as they were burying Dani. And it reminded me in many ways of the very appearance of where we discuss the very terms and ideas related to mourning in the Talmud. Most of the laws of mourning in the Talmud appear in tractate Moed Katan, which talks about Chol HaMoed, the intermediate days that are wedged between the first days of Yom Tov and the second days of Yom Tov. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the tractate, we digress from the laws of Chol HaMoed and we talk about all of the laws of mourning. And many people have questioned why all of a sudden are we talking over here in this tractate that's talking about this joyful, fun time that we associate with trips to the Bronx Zoo and Six Flags Great Adventures. Why are we talking about mourning all of a sudden? There's a project that I've been involved in since the beginning of Dafyomi where at the end of every tractate, I actually write a brief essay examining the themes of each mesechta, the themes of each tractate. And it was on tractate Moed Katan that I discussed why mourning in particular appears within this tractate in the context of Chala Moed. Are we talking about the laws of Avelos and mourning? And it's an idea that was inspired by a Rav known as the Kaja Glover, Rav Aryeh Tzvi Frumer, who explains, and it's a little bit of my own interpretation, but he really inspired this idea, is that the reason why the laws of mourning appear in the laws of Chalamoed is because life itself is one long Chalamoed. Because we begin life, so to speak, connected to God, unified with God, and we come out into this world, into this liminal state where holiness and and unholiness, where sacred and profane are all mixed together within our lifetime. And ultimately, at the end of our lives, we return back to God and have those second days of Yuntif, so to speak. And like Yuntif itself, that is bookended by these unified experiences of Yuntif, and in between, we have these strange period of Cholamoid where holiness and the mundane are all mixed together, in many ways our life itself mirrors this parallel, where our life, so to speak, can be seen as a Cholamoid. I concluded the essay with an idea that I think relates to everything that we've been discussing about loss. Mourning is upheaval, liminality, instability. Caught between worlds, mourners confront the ultimate absence and can't help but feel a little less permanent. If a family is the vehicle through which we form our identity, who are we when they are gone? The very customs of mourning address this head-on. During a shiva call, there is a custom to say the Hebrew phrase, Hamakom yenachem eschem besoch shar avolitzin v'yushalayim. May God comfort you among all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. We slowly bring the mourner out from the silence of isolation into the communal comfort of language. God in this passage is referred to as Hamakom, literally meaning the place. We remind mourners that even within the instability of liminality, still the stability of place, identity, we remain connected to the eternal place, namely God. I know it feels like you are no longer you without a loved one, we seem to be implicitly saying, but our collective identity is couched in something 
that can never be entirely lost. And following the Shiva period, mourners say Kaddish, Yiskad al Yiskad Shmei Rabba, may his name grow exalted and sanctified. Staring at the Cholomoe that is our lives, we insist that even gazing at our own fragility, our Chol, we can still grasp eternity, our Moed, from within our liminality. Through Kaddish, explains Rabbi Salavechik, we hurl defiance at death and its fiendish conspiracy against man. Kaddish is the declaration that no matter how powerful death is, notwithstanding the ugly end of man, however terrifying the grave is, However nonsensical and absurd everything appears, no matter how black one's despair is and how nauseating an affair life is, we declare and profess publicly and solemnly that we are not giving up, that we are not surrendering. Ba'alma divra chiruse, in the world that God created, we will not go gently into the darkness of silence. Ba'yamlech malchuse b'chayechon v'yomechon, that may God reign in our lifetime and days, even in liminality, we can still sense divinity. And in the lifetime of the entire family of Israel, the Jewish people, we will always remain firmly rooted in the internal. And now respond, Amen. And it's those ideas that echo in that prayer, in that song, that as they were burying Dani, they sang the words, Mimkomcha, the same description that we have from Hamakom Yenachim, they affirm that even in absence, we can still long and through our anticipation, through our longing and yearning, forge a presence. Ki mechakim anach nulach. Masai timloch b'tzion. We wait, we yearn, we're looking for that stability that is so often lost in the liminality of our lives. And finally, like the words of Kaddish, Tiskada v'tiskadash, no matter how powerful death is, no matter how painful the absence may be, we declare and profess publicly, in the words of Rabbi Salavechik, we declare and profess publicly and solemnly that we're not giving up, that we are not surrendering. Tiskada v'tiskadash, betoch Yerushalayim ircha, become sanctified and uplifted. Within your city, Jerusalem, Lador Vador, Ulanetzach Nitzachem. From generation to generation and for all eternity. So, thank you so much for listening. This episode was sponsored by my dearest friend, Victor and Jessica Kagan, in memory of his mother, Rachel Minda Bas Nasanata, and his brother, who I knew well and miss dearly, Naftali Ben Chaim Shraga Feivel. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends.